Thank you, Greg. I'm going to talk today about things that humans do to nature. And we do, we change nature all the time and in the hopes that we're going to get benefits from it. I'm going to give you some examples today of, of the occasions when we change nature, but nature bites back. And sometimes it can bite back really hard in very environmentally damaging ways and very financially damaging ways. And the examples that I'm going to talk about all come from the realm of invasive species, species that people have moved, either accidentally or intentionally, from where they naturally occurred on the planet to somewhere else. And some of these species that humans move around end up causing far more harm than the benefits that we may have hoped for initially. So those species that we move around and end up causing more harm than benefits, we call invasive species. And just to jump ahead, I'm going to tell you a conclusion of what I'm talking about, and then I, I hope I'll convince you of that conclusion as I go along. And that is that we don't have to continue to live with the harms that invasive species cause. And in fact, with recent science and technological developments, we can prevent new invasions from happening and solve some of the ones that we have. The first example I'm going to show you is actually from a little bit of deep personal history. I'm going to reveal some, some family history here. The guy in the middle of the top photograph here is my great-grandfather on his farm near Auburn, Alabama in about 1938. And he gathered people around him on the farm in order to celebrate his successful introduction of kudzu onto his farm near Auburn. Kudzu, the vine that ate the south, that came originally from Asia. My great-grandfather introduced it to provide some benefits, to control soil erosion and to replenish nitrogen in the soil. And it did those things. But it did a whole lot more over time, as you can see from the bottom photograph. So, there's several hundreds of millions of dollars spent every year now controlling kudzu to prevent it from covering up trees and reducing forest production, from covering up pasture lands, and from covering up buildings. In case you missed the point, the thing in the middle of that bottom photograph is a barn. And my uncle still lives on this farm near Auburn, Alabama, and spends, is one of the thousands of farmers and other landowners across the country that spends a lot of time and effort now controlling kudzu that my great-grandfather introduced. Now let me hasten to add, my great-grandfather was not the only person to, <laughs> to, <coughs> to introduce kudzu. He had accomplices. But it turns out to be a great and ongoing example of a very damaging invasion. So in the next slide, you're going to see Starting at the top, you can see the year at the top there above the map, and states turn green when they've been invaded by kudzu. And the thing I want you to notice especially is that this invasion is still going on. Two years ago, Indiana, you'll see Washington and Oregon blink on uh, in, in the very uh, near past. So the damages that uh, kudzu causes continue to grow over space and grow in magnitude approaching probably a billion dollars for the United States. And most recently, kudzu has been joined by its old friend, the kudzu bug from Asia, which for a century, kudzu lived in the United States without the kudzu bug. Now you might think it's a good thing for the kudzu bug, which eats kudzu, to have joined it in the United States. But it turns out that the kudzu bug bites back as well. It is eating some kudzu, but the kudzu bug loves soybeans just as much as it loves kudzu. And in, since, 19, since 2009, when the kudzu bug joined kudzu in Georgia and is spreading, as you can see from that map, in the epicenter of the kudzu bug invasion, soybean yields are now decreased by up to 20% on an annual basis. So this is a thing that we've done to nature, moved to species, two species now, um, that continues to bite and bite back harder and harder. Lo losing production of soybeans 
is a major problem for North American agriculture. And that is going to spread over time if we don't adopt more effective management. So invasive species are not only coming intentionally, Kudzu was introduced intentionally, they're not only coming intentionally, and they're not only coming by land. They're coming by sea and sometimes unintentionally. Two species of little mussels, individually small mussels. You can see that a bunch of mussels on that disc that someone is holding there. Zebra mussels and quagga mussels. They arrived in the Great Lakes from northern Europe in ships. And they are causing hundreds of millions of dollars of damage also. All the shipborne invasions that have come into the Great Lakes since the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway are approaching half a billion dollars annually in damages to our economy. Again, a non-trivial problem from just one species. Now, in the next slide, you can see they arrived in the Great Lakes by ship, but now, if you watch that timeline up at the top, you can see the spread of these two species of mussels across the country since their discovery in about 1986. They escaped the Great Lakes by shooting down the Chicago Canal into the Mississippi River, and then we had lots of early warning signs that they're going across the country on recreational boats especially. We predicted that they would first invade Lake Mead in the West, and Lake Mead is the beachhead for the invasion of the rest of the water systems, very important water infrastructure that feeds the agriculture of California. Now, the states in the northwestern United States and the southwestern provinces of Canada are scared to death that these mussels are going to invade the Columbia River system where there's a whole nother set of water infrastructure and agriculture and fisheries infrastructure that could be damaged by just these two species. So invasive species intentionally by land, unintentionally by water, sometimes intentionally by water as well, and again, far more harms than any benefits that accrue. Harms not just to plugging up pipes and shutting down conventional and nuclear power plants, but harms to recreational uses of waterway and commercial uses of waterway. Beaches have been closed, as that bottom right photograph suggests, because they're covered with very sharp zebra mussel shells. Nobody wants to go to the beach on Lake Erie anymore that looks like that. Those examples, kudzu, the kudzu bug, the two mussels, they are just four drops in the global bucket of invasive species. And I've shown a few more drops on this slide to give you the idea that this is not unique to the United States. We're not just the unfortunate, unusual recipients of damaging species like this. We're also exporting them. And they are species, different species are going from continent to continent all across the globe. And you might say, well, why is that happening? Why is it happening so rapidly now? And here's why. Because we have more and bigger and faster airplanes. Every one of those yellow dots is an airplane. This is a, just a day's worth of airplane movements on the planet. Some of those planes are intentionally carrying shipments of plants and animals that we want to, to have in our yards and in our homes. And most of those are perfectly good to have, but some of them, like those species I've talked about, will turn out to be highly damaging. Likewise, we have a global shipping network which links every port on the planet. This animation shows you just one year's worth of ships, and it's highlighting, in this case, the connections of the Great Lakes to every other port on the planet, but the conclusion that applies to the Great Lakes applies to every other port. A species in any port on the planet can conceivably be transported by ship to any other port on the planet. There are only four or five degrees of separation, if you will, in this global network of shipping. So if we don't manage ships better and planes better and our commerce better, we're gonna end up with lots more kudzus and other damaging species. I'm gonna show you one more example. This comes from a human pathogen. And here the timeline is at the bottom of the slide. And an important point is that this timeline is only about six months long. And the point is gonna be that you're gonna watch an invasion spread across the planet in red and yellow, and then you're gonna watch that invasion get reversed as those countries that turn red and yellow then turn gray. This is a human pathogen, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. We're celebrating the 10th anniversary. Uh, this is something to celebrate, not that it started, but that it ended, 
um, of the outbreak, global outbreak of SARS. Started in South uh, China, spread to the United States very quickly on those planes as humans carried that pathogen across the planet very quickly. And the point of me showing this to you is that very effective steps were taken, quarantining sick individuals, encouraging people to take steps to prevent the spread. And when it was realized how important air travel was to the spread of SARS and what SARS was, to take steps in airports to screen, to profile people for potential carrying, using thermal screening. People who had fevers, they had some special uh, care taken about whether it was a good idea to let them travel. In the end, about 8,000 cases of this disease in just a few months started in southern China, spread from animals to people, jumped across the globe, 8,000 people. This disease killed about 10% of the people that it infected. But my point in showing this is that we reversed it. We reversed it by all those actions that I mentioned, by preventing its spread, by, by taking care of looking at people in airports and, and seeing whether they might be infected, by preventing the spread locally, and eventually completely eradicating that disease in humans in just a few months. This is an invasive species. We took effective action because we already had scientific and technological infrastructure because we care about people dying, as we should. My point, though, is that we know how to do this for this kind of invasive species, and we could also do it for those other kinds of invasive species. And the research that we and others are doing, uh, we at Notre Dame and others uh, at other universities, are mimicking our very effective approach to public health and infectious disease for these other kinds of invasions that I started out with. We've developed environmental DNA, a better way to track where species are. You can't manage a species if you don't know where it is. And every species leaves a cloud of DNA behind that we can use to figure out where it is. We've developed uh, scientific, technological, and statistical tools to make better decisions that could have informed my great-grandfather that kudzu, in the end, was going to be a really bad idea. We can use tools to, to predict ahead of time if there are 10 fishes proposed for importation, we can screen those and say, yeah, these are the nine that are unlikely to cause any harm. Let people have those in the Great Lakes region, in this case, uh, anyway. But that one species, that's not a good idea. That's the next kudzu. That's the next Asian carp. So we can allow commerce to continue, but allow it to bring greater benefits because we reduce the side effect harms. For species that do get established, like SARS, we can eradicate them. There are lots of examples, and I just show you a few examples globally here, of successful eradications. When we mobilize the technology and scientific understanding of these species that has accumulated over the decades, we can effectively control these diseases like we, or these invasive species like we controlled SARS. We can, as with SARS, we can slow the spread, and the specific Northwest states in, in North America are getting mobilized now to do just this, to keep zebra mussels and quagga mussels out of the Columbia River Basin. We can put ballast water treatment systems on board ships to keep the next zebra and quagga mussels from arriving. We can put electric barriers in the Chicago Canal to keep Asian carps from invading the Great Lakes. And when we're stuck with invasions, when we can't eradicate them, but it, they're causing so much damage, we can control them. We spend $20 million, we, the United States with Canada, every year to control sea lampreys. That's an expensive but highly successful control program. We do that because we gain huge economic benefits from spending that $20 million. We're protecting a $7 billion freshwater fishery in the Great Lakes. We could use that as an example to motivate lots of other cases. Farmers do this all the time, like with Johnson uh, grass and all sorts of other weeds that come from other continents. We know how to control things when we mobilize the science and technology to do it. So I hope that I've, I've given you some examples of invasive species and pointed the way toward how we can respond as a society more effectively to them. We do not have to continue making the kind of decisions that in hindsight were clearly bad decisions, like the one that my great-grandfather participated in, in introducing kudzu. And in using recent uh, technological and scientific advances, we can not only protect our environment and our human health, but bring net economic benefit to our country and every country on the planet. Thank you.